Okay, this is about why I hate Freud um, and why I feel Freud has become or was the great menace of the 20th century. Um, and we need to leave Freud behind. And just because he made the discovery, as it were, of the unconscious, um, doesn't mean we have to believe what he thinks um, uh, comprises the, the, um, sub, up, the unconscious. Um, it's almost as though um, he discovered the moon and everyone went yay and he went um, and it's made of cheese and everyone went well that must be right because he discovered the moon. Um, it doesn't follow that just because you saw something um, and then you named its, um, its composition that you're right with both facts. Um, and it seems to me that he's still so central to how we think about ourselves. Um, and I want to read something from, um, um, and it, it's to just point out these kind of extraordinary leaps that just because, you know, he was a genius, and he absolutely was a genius. I mean, my definition of genius is invention plus influence. Um, and, uh, you know, he created things and he was hugely influential, so he's a genius. But it was, we, we, we just misunderstood, um, uh, or we didn't read closely enough um, his, uh, his, you know, how, how he made connections and how impossibly stupid they were. Um, so let's just, let's just go through a classic, the, you know, the Oedipus complex. Let's just, just read through the Oedipus complex. Once the boy has entered the phallic phase of his libido development from two to three years old, has obtained pleasurable sensations from his sexual organ and has learned how to create these for himself whenever he feels it through manual st stimulation. Okay, that's all fine. That's all right. He becomes the mother's lover. Really? How do you get from one point to the other? Yes, of course. The hand may go to his sexual organ and... He understands the sensation, but he becomes the mother's lover. I don't know. He desires to possess her physically in the ways he is divined. Do they divine two to three year olds? Um, his observations and his notions of sexual life. He tries to seduce her by showing her his male member, his pride and joy. I don't think any of that is true. Um, in short, his early awakened maleness tries to replace his father in her, fe her, fe her affections. The father has already been envied in his role model up to this point due to the physical strength in which he perceives him and due to the authority in which he, he sees him clothed. I mean, yes, to a certain degree, a boy might look at his father at that early age, possibly definitely a bit older, and see a role model, see something that he might aspire to. Why it initiates in a kind of sexualized role, I don't know. Um, now the father is the rival who stands in his way and who he wishes to get rid of. Don't think that's true. If his father happened to be away and he was allowed to share his mother's bed, only to find himself banished from it again on his father's return, then it comes to make a profound impression on him. His father's disappearance means gratification and his re-emergent means disappointment. I think in certain, on a certain level of, 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 of love and closeness and you know, emotional intimacy and physical intimacy, yes, it doesn't have to be sexualized. Um, this is the content of the Oedipus complex, which the Greek legend has translated from the child's fantasies, world of supposed reality, in a particular cultural circumstance, a terrible end normally awaits it. Yeah, that's why we're all killing our fathers. Um, now this is bit, this bit where it gets, it gets both daft and damaging. The mother understands perfectly well that the boy's sexual arousal relates to her own person. Does she? And does it? At some point she reflects that it is wrong to allow it to continue and she believes she is doing the right thing if she for forbids him to manipulate his member. Well, one, you know, it might be back in the late 19th century, early 20th century, 
that mothers, when seeing their sons touch uh, his penis, say you shouldn't do it because they think he's using her as a sexualized object in order to arouse himself. I don't think so. Um, this ban, though, is of little use at most. It brings about a modification in the method of self gratification. Eventually, the mother re re resorts to the severest measure. She threatens to take the thing away from which he is using to defy her. She's essentially, and this is this is this is uh, this is wonderful. She usually attributes the responsibility for carrying out this threat to the father in order to make it more terrifying and believable. So, sorry, she says um, she will tell father, and he will chop it off. Um, Okay, so essentially, and you know, one would like to do a survey of how many, how many you know mothers, even you know, it, it may be in the less enlightened age, it was more than now. But actually, you know, most people aren't that enlightened. They're essentially saying, if you carry on touching yourself, my young son of two or three, I will get your father to chop it off. Strangely enough, the threat is only effective if another condition is fulfilled, both beforehand and afterwards, covering all bases here. It, it itself, it seems all too unmanageable or that such a thing could happen. Yeah, well, of course it does. But if when he is threatened, he can recall what a genital female looks like, sorry, female genitals looks like, or if he encounters such genitals shortly afterwards where the part of the body prized above all else, that's an assumption, um, really is absent, then he believes in the gravity of what he has heard and becoming admired in castration complex, enhances experiences the most severe trauma of his young life. Um, okay, so that's, that is essentially two you know, huge parts, huge pillars of the Freudian sexual theory, um, which is the Oedipus complex and the castration complex. Um, it's all played out in Freud's head. Um, it seems to me, you know, I have a son and a daughter, I have other friends of my father, when we talk, it is it is an extraordinary extrapolation. It is narrativizing and finding a um, you know, classical reference to describe um, Freud's own psychological complexes. It seems to me, it, it, um, and, and as George Steiner, you know, once points out, a wonderful essay dismantling Freud. Um, you know, Freud's patients were all upper middle class, intellectual, um, classically educated Jewish women. Um, the fact that they were Jewish is neither here nor there, but it you know it remains the case. Um, but the fact is is you know that that, that these these theories have been created from a very narrow band of society um, by a man who um, was hugely, um, uh, you know, hugely literate and a, you know, and a brilliant writer and, a, and, and one with, you know, an you know, extraordinary imagination. Um, but it's bollocks. Um, I don't think any of you know, and you might say, well, what the hell, what the hell do I know? Well, well quite frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm going with my, uh, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a novelist, I'm older than Freud now when he wrote that stuff, and I'm using common sense here, which is that um, it is so clear he has narrativized a set of behaviours which make sense, but just aren't true. And that's it. And then you know, he says other. Th he other says other many many wonderful things. But the rock upon which Freudian sexual theory is um, uh, is built is essentially that one passage there. I leave you to make up your mind.